But first, working as a Prime Minister's Chief of Staff was the best time of my life. The best job I've ever had and am likely to ever had. But seeing that PM unjustly turf from his office was the worst, especially as I was collateral damage in Malcolm Turnbull's campaign to seize the country's top job that he could never have won fair and square in a general election. Because it was so painful, I've hardly ever spoken about it publicly. Now, sure, I talk about politics and policy every night here with you, but not this. However, as I watched the ABC's Nemesis program on Monday night, it all came back. So after 10 years of holding it all in, I wrote about how that felt in my column today for The Australian. As I wrote, partly traumatic was reliving the trauma, but also cathartic in a way to see the anti-Abbott plotters finally exposed for what they were and still are. And I want to share with you some of that response. You and my Sky News family, I want to talk to you tonight. Now, to his credit, to its credit, the ABC largely let some of the key people tell their own story. Yes, the ABC still got to decide what they put to wear and what ended up on the cutting room floor. But no one put the words into the mouths of these MPs. And it's their words on Monday night that condemned them and helped Australians outside of politics see what I saw inside it at its grubby, tawdry worst. Apparently, both Turnbull and Scott Morrison each gave some eight hours of reflections and responses to the ABC. Tony Abbott, well, he declined to be involved because he said he didn't want to rake over old coals. He didn't want to be trapped into bad-mouthing colleagues and he felt he'd more than dealt with the ups and downs of his government on camera in press conferences at the time. So the ABC found the old Abbott footage to tell his side of the story. Now, what was on display on Monday night was a Prime Minister doing his best to run the country, to stop the boats, to fix the budget, to scrap the taxes and to build the new roads our country then needed, while being undermined and sabotaged from the very beginning by some of his so-called colleagues. The revolving door prime ministership with Turnbull and Morrison first machinating against Abbott and then Morrison machinating against Turnbull was what made a period of coalition government that should have been as good as John Howard's scarcely much better than Malcolm Fraser's. A tragedy for our country, an embarrassment to the Liberal Party and a disgrace, especially to the two men in particular who put their own advancement ahead of the long-term national interest. And your interests, your family's interests. As Turnbull had earlier revealed in his memoirs, but this time he repeated it on camera, he and Morrison, he said, first started plotting the removal of Abbott from the prime ministership, even before Abbott's landslide win in 2013. By midway through 2014, the organising and the backroom dealing was well underway. Here's Turnbull from Monday night. Scott was loudly proclaiming his loyalty to Tony Abbott and at the same time organising his supporters to vote for me. And, and we had an understanding that if I became Prime Minister, he would be Treasurer. And here's Morrison's shifty and unconvincing response. No, I don't recall Malcolm offering me Treasurer before. I don't recall that. That's... I don't know where that's from. Um, I was not a protagonist in this. Meanwhile, the campaign to politically assassinate the man who'd brought them all back into government in record time picked up pace. Here is a bloke who only entered Parliament after his millionaire dad called on Abbott and said, please help my son get a seat, and who that then later quit that seat after Turnbull was ousted in 2018. Malcolm is normally, a, you know, a really confident, gregarious person, but I was watching him and as it became apparent that we had the numbers, he really went back into his shell. He got really quiet and nervous. 
Like the, it was like the penny was dropping for him that this was now a go. But the term of forces only succeeded because the Morrison numbers were with them. I was getting phone calls from various what you'd call warlords from, from, from New South Wales who were pushing the need for, for Tony to, to go. There's no way that I would be receiving phone calls from those individuals in New South Wales unless they were doing that with the approval of their political master. It's as simple as that. And that master was Scott Morrison. I assume that their master is Scott Morrison. If only Abbott had been allowed to get on with the job the coalition was elected to do, would have had a budget surplus. Japanese submarines are a much better managed welfare system, tax and federation reform, and a much better managed immigration program. As well as border control, the budget repair, an end to the carbon tax, mining tax, those three big trade deals and the infrastructure boom that actually got done from just two years of the Abbott government. And the Prime Minister too, prepared to stand up to President Putin over that MH17 atrocity and send troops to help the fight against Islamic State and more. As I said, such a waste and tragedy for our country. Once Abbott was gone, the government was more Labor light than centre right. And it wasn't just that the government got worse. For several years, we got a dreadful culture of leaking and backstabbing and the politics of personal destruction. It's fair to say that you win at that point in time and there's the euphoria of having done it, the fact that we think, hey, let's get this show back on the road. But what you don't appreciate is the depth of anger of some of those in the room and the lengths they will go to as time moves forward to exact revenge and retribution. Uh, when he says win there, he's not talking about winning an election fair and square. He's talking about winning the numbers in a party room coup. Now, it's worth setting the record straight now on a couple of issues from that time. The 2014 budget, well, Abbott had been explicit in the election campaign and before it that the coalition would not support the Gillard cash splash on schools, hospitals, which were all beyond the then forward estimates. The money didn't exist. And history shows that the total spending on health and education continued to increase, yes, increase under Abbott, only at a slower and more sustainable rate than before. Abbott was just following the Hawke government precedent and seeking a modest co-payment on GP visits and extending an earlier labour move to raise the pension age and to reduce the indexation rates for some social security benefits. Seeking to have school leavers learn or earn rather than just go on the dole was a worthy bid to break the something for nothing mindset it's so contrary to who we are as Australians. And there was nothing sneaky or underhand about how he handled same-sex marriage. Abbott always said that if it came up in the 2013 parliamentary term, it would be dealt with in the normal way by the coalition party room, which it was. Indeed, he specifically discussed putting the issue to a plebiscite with a key frontbencher, the same frontbencher, I might add, who subsequently claimed it was all a surprise to him, he put it to him at a dinner in Adelaide a few weeks earlier. Now, I know because I was there. As Abbott said at the time, people's attitude to marriage is so personal that it should be decided directly by them rather than by MPs. And that, he thought, would mean that whatever the outcome, Australians would accept it without rancour. Now, he was right. Resolving this issue via the plebiscite that Turnbull had opposed actually turned out to be one of the few achievements of the Turnbull government. Now, with time to reflect, it's now clear that one of the key differences between our public life in the Hawke and Howard era and more recently has been the decline in personal character. Our best recent PMs were able to succeed because big egos with different policy positions were much readier to buckle down and support the government and the leader of the day. Most of them saw public life in terms of service to the nation rather than personal advancement and didn't let resentments get the better of them if they were never put into cabinet or even if they never got past the backbench. 
Perhaps the most dispiriting aspect of Nemesis' first episode was the credibility it gave to a raft of MPs smarting at Abbott's move to end family members being employed by the father or the son or the mother or the wife, so the kids and the wife, on your expense in their office, or first-class overseas travel. After having a ringside seat at the self-destruction of the Rudd-Gillard government, I never thought that the coalition would indulge in an action replay. Now, I always knew Turnbull would try and come for Abbott one day, but I didn't think MPs would buy the carpet bag of spiel in the first term, especially after his patent failures as opposition leader. Now, like Abbott, I declined to appear in the program because I was certain of a selective and distorted version of my response to the usual crap that I was too tough. Too tough on entitlements, they said. Well, I tell you, what's the alternative? Lose ministers in a first term like the Howard government did? The complaint that MPs couldn't get to Abbott? Come on. You couldn't use a mobile phone? You couldn't walk around to his office or, or perhaps buttonhole him after question time? That I was too outspoken with ministers? Well, isn't that what you pay advisers to do? Speak their mind, not just meekly agree? Now, I served as a political staffer for 16 years because I believe in the Liberal Party's values. Perfect? No one is. But I was loyal, absolutely loyal, and always working for the government, not trying to undermine it. That's why it hurt so much to see the party used by carpetbaggers and careerists who should never have been given the honour of Liberal Party pre-selection in the first place. And in the process to have my own reputation attacked. The reputation for, for policy and procedural smarts that I'd earned in the Howard years and all the way through opposition. And the grudging recognition that a woman on my side of the aisle could be just as good as the blokes when it came to political campaigning. Everything was used against me. Even my years on IVF by low lifes like Clive Palmer. As I said today, some days I honestly, I honestly don't know how I managed to survive. And I mean that literally. A big part of what helped me keep my head together was never wanting the haters to succeed. While we don't agree on, on so many things, I'll never forget the humanity of Bill Shorten and later Anthony Albanese, who both quietly and privately reached out to me to express their disgust at my treatment. This wasn't blows from labour. This was my own side. Julia Gillard and Julie Bishop, well, as I wrote today, maybe that card's still in the mail. One of the reasons I'm now in the public square is to let people who have heard the criticisms take a closer look at me and make up your own mind. Being here each night, and it's your support that's made my show number one on this channel for the past three years, is my answer to those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Those lines are magnificent prose by Teddy Roosevelt. It's called The Man in the Arena, and it's what helped keep me sane. Well, now that Morrison has joined Turnbull in exiting the parliament, my hope is for an end to the self-serving duplicity of recent years, so that the next coalition government can be so much better than the last.